Hi everyone, I am Sujini, Faculty in Physics at the Institute of Aeronautical Engineering, Hyderabad. Today we are going to discuss the tutorial question bank on module 2, that is Introduction to Solids and Semiconductors in the course Engineering Physics. So let us start with uh, the short answer questions. In my previous lecture, I have discussed about the pattern of the exam. We have different types of assessment here. Uh, the continuous internal evaluation where you will be asked short answer questions. And also you have the semester end exam where you will have the long answer questions and you have analytical questions in both the papers. So therefore, we are dividing the questions into short answer, long answer and analytical questions. So first let us look at the short answer questions. So the first question here is define block theorem. So how do we define block theorem? So block theorem establishes that the wave function psi k of r in a crystal obtained from the Schrodinger equation can be expressed as a product of the plane wave and a function u k of r. So we are writing it as a product of a plane wave and a function u k of r which has the same periodicity as the lattice. So after considering the periodicity, how the wave function is getting modified? This is given by block. So psi k of r is equal to u k of r, which talk, this u k of r talks about the periodicity and e i k r is the plane wave function. Now what is the next question? Define a metallic solid and draw its band diagram to explain the electronic behavior. So, what is a metallic solid? Free electron model of metals in solid state physics represents a metallic solid as a container filled with a gas composed of free electrons. So, it is just like a container which is filled with a gas where the electrons are free to move and they are responsible for high electrical and thermal conductivity. So these free electrons, they are identical to the outermost or the valence electrons of a free metal. So when we are taking a free metal, the electrons are arranged in a particular fashion. So what are the electrons that are there in the outermost or valence electrons? We are considering them as free electrons. And they are presumed to be moving independently of one another throughout the crystal. Independently here means not considering any other interactions of these electrons. So that is how the classical free electron theory was explained. Now the next question, classify the crystalline solids based on band theory. So we have to talk about the classification of materials based on band theory. So let us see the classification. So on the basis of the magnitude of the forbidden band, the or we call it as the energy gap, solids are classified into insulators, semiconductors and conductors. So the classification is here is three, insulators, semiconductors and conductors and these are the uh, band diagrams. So we are talking about the band versus the energy. So when we are talking first about conductors, this is the band diagram. How is the band diagram? The valence band and the conduction band are overlapping with each other and there is no gap between the conduction band and the valence band. That is how we identify a conductor on the basis of band gap. So absolutely no band gap, but there is an overlap between the valence band and the conduction band. Now come to the semiconductors. In semiconductors, there is a gap. There is a small forbidden gap between the valence band and the conduction band. This is of the order of one electron volt. 
So how we are classifying semiconductors? If the gap between the valence band and the conduction band is of the order of one electron volt, we call it as semiconductor. Then what is an insulator? If the gap between valence band and conduction band is very large of the order of seven electron volt, then we call it as insulators. So this is how we classify the materials into conductors, semiconductors and insulators based on the energy band gap. Now coming to the fourth one. Define a semiconductor and draw its band diagram to explain its electronic behavior. So first we will have to define what a semiconductor is. Then we will draw the band diagram and also explain its electronic behavior. So let us uh, see what is a semiconductor. So in a semiconductor, the forbidden gap or the forbidden energy gap is very small. So if you see here, this is the valence band. This is the conduction band. And there is a gap between the valence band and the conduction band. This gap is small. I told you it is of the order of one electron volt. So now if we are talking in specific about different semiconductors, if we take the semiconductor germanium, the gap is of the order of 0 0.7 electron volt. And for silicon, it is 1.1 electron volt. So for different semiconductors, it is different. But the gap between the valence band and the conduction band is very small. Now explain their behavior. At 0 Kelvin, there are no electrons in the conduction band. So if you see here, this is at 0 Kelvin, at absolute 0 temperature. You see the valence band is full. This is filled, but the conduction band is unfilled or it is empty. So absolutely it does not conduct at 0 Kelvin. They, it will behave like an insulator. But as the temperature increases, so what happens? Electrons from the valence band jump to the conduction band. So when we are supplying energy with the help of increasing in temperature, some of the electrons may jump to the conduction band. Therefore, the conduction band becomes partially filled. So the resistivity varies between 10 power minus 14 to 10 power 7. So if the resistivity decreases, the conductivity increases. So with the increase in temperature, the semiconductors start conducting. Next one is insulators. What is an insulator and how, how is the band gap? In case of insulators, the forbidden band or the energy band is very wide. So if this is the valence band, this is what we are talking about is the valence band. This is the conduction band. But the gap between the two is very large of the order of 7 electron volt. So because of this, what happens? Electrons cannot jump from the valence band to the conduction band. So when there is a huge gap between the valence band and the conduction band, the electrons cannot easily go from valence band to conduction band. Means we need minimum we need to supply an energy of 7 electron volt for the uh, electrons to go to the conduction band. They have completely filled valence band and completely empty conduction band. You, you can see in the diagram here, all the electrons are in the valence band. So the valence band is completely filled and the conduction band is completely empty. So the resistivity of insulators is very high. So the insulators means they do not conduct. They are bad conductors of electricity. So because of this reason, because of the band gap being very high, there is no movement of electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. So therefore, they behave like insulators or they are very bad conductors of electricity. Now conductors. So what are conductors? In conductors, there is no forbidden gap. So this is the valence band. This is the valence band shown in green. And this is the conduction band. 
denoted by the yellow box. And if you see, there is no gap between the conduction band and the valence band. There is no gap. So, the electrons from the valence band can freely enter into the conduction band. Since there is no gap, these electrons from the valence band can easily move into the conduction band. So, even at room temperature, means around 30 degrees Celsius, a large number of electrons are available for conduction. So, that is how they are conducting very easily. So, without any additional energy, metals contain a large number of free electrons because these electrons when they are going into the conduction band means they are free, they start conducting. So, they behave as good conductors. Now coming to the seventh question. Explain the classification of semiconductors based on variation of conductivity in terms of temperature and doping. So here we are going to talk about the classification of semiconductors. So how do we classify the semiconductors? So if we take a semiconductor, the broad classification is two. One is intrinsic semiconductor, which are pure semiconductors. Intrinsic semiconductors are pure semiconductors and extrinsic semiconductors are impure. They are impure semiconductors. So, in intrinsic semiconductors, we take the examples of germanium and silicon. They are of the pure form. Now, when we want impure semiconductors means a pure semiconductor, we add an impurity. And based on the type of impurity we are adding, we are classifying it into two types, n-type and p-type. So, when the impurity added is a pentavalent impurity. So, pentavalent impurity means all those elements that belong to the fifth group, which have five valence electrons, we call them as pentavalent impurities, like phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, all these come under pentavalent impurities. So, whenever you take a pure a semiconductor like silicon or germanium and add one of these impurities, then it becomes a n-type semiconductor and we call it as donor impurity because uh, it is always ready to donate an electron. So, we call it as N donor impurity. Now, coming to p-type, when we are adding a trivalent impurity, so, those elements from the third group, when we are adding, which have three valence electrons, we call it as trivalent impurity. Examples of trivalent impurities, gallium, boron, indium, aluminium, all these are from third group. So, when we are adding uh, such elements, it becomes a P-type semiconductor and it is a acceptor impurity. So, when we are adding an element from the third group, it has three valence electron and the silicon, suppose if we are adding to silicon, it has four. So, it is always ready to accept one electron. So, we call it as acceptor impurity, which is denoted by Na. Now, the next thing is explain in detail about intrinsic semiconductor. So, in a pure silicon or germanium crystal, each atom is surrounded by four identical atoms and each atom possesses four valence electrons and it forms four covalent bonds with the four neighboring atoms to attain closed shell configuration. So, the first thing what we need to understand whenever we are taking a silicon or a germanium crystal which is a pure crystal, it consists of many silicon atoms which are arranged in a regular fashion. And each silicon has four valence electrons and to attain closed shell configuration or we call it as octet configuration, they will bond with the neighboring atoms. And at zero Kelvin, there are no electrons in the conduction band because all the electrons are bonded, are forming covalent bonds with their neighboring atoms. There are no electrons which are free. So, when there are no free electrons, so the conduction band is completely empty. So, the electrical conductivity of the semiconductor is zero. So, in the pure form when you take, the electrical conductivity is zero. But as the temperature increases, what happens when the covalent bonds break? 
with the increase in temperature the bonds will break so when they break there are free electrons available so it starts conducting so they will start conducting electricity so let us understand it with the figure okay so this is the silicon crystal we are talking about each silicon uh, atom has four valence electrons so each one is having four now these four electrons form covalent bonds with their neighboring atoms so these are the bonds they are formed so all the four will be bonded there will be one more atom here which we are not showing but it will be forming the bond here like this so all the four electrons are forming bonds with the neighboring atoms and they are bound now they are not free this is at 0 kelvin so what happens at 0 kelvin the valence band is completely full all the electrons are in the valence band and the conduction band is vacant so when it is vacant it does not conduct and it behaves as an insulator this is in case of an intrinsic or a pure semiconductor now what is doping the process of adding impurity is called doping so when we are taking an intrinsic semiconductor we are adding an impurity to it either a trivalent or a pentavalent we have seen in the last slide so when we are adding an impurity this process of adding an impurity we are calling it as doping and the impurity that is added is called the dopant either the trivalent or the pentavalent impurity whatever impurity we have added we will call it as the dopant and then what happens to the conductivity because of doping the conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor can be increased by adding small amounts of impurity so we have seen with the effect of temperature what happened the conductivity is increasing and with the doping also what is happening the conductivity is increased by small amounts by adding small amounts of impurity impurities are either from the third group or from the fifth group now the 10th question what is an extrinsic semiconductor how is it more useful than an intrinsic semiconductor so we have talked about intrinsic semiconductor in detail now we are going to talk about extrinsic semiconductor and how extrinsic semiconductors are useful than intrinsic semiconductors so extrinsic semiconductor means what it's an impure semiconductor the conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor can be increased by adding small amounts of impurity atoms such as third or fifth group so when we are adding an impurity it is becoming a extrinsic semiconductor so when we are adding an impurity what is happening the conductivity for example if you are taking silica it is increased by 1000 times on adding 10 parts of boron we are talking about a trivalent impurity suppose we are adding a trivalent impurity boron to silica then what is happening thousand times it is increasing on adding 10 parts per million parts in 10 in million 1 million if you are adding only 10 parts also the conductivity is increasing by thousand times that is how extrinsic semiconductor is more useful than an intrinsic semiconductor now let us see the expression for the electron concentration in the conduction band of an intrinsic semiconductor so when we are talking about intrinsic semiconductor it is a pure semiconductor and at absolute zero all the electrons are in the val valence band so as the temperature increases the electrons will go to the conduction band so what is the concentration of electrons in the conduction band that is the expression we are going to see because it's not a long answer question you will have to only write the expression and explain the terms that are there in here. So N here represents the electron concentration. N represents the electron concentration. Where are the electrons now? The electrons are in the conduction band. So we are talking about the electron concentration in conduction band. 
is equal to 2 into 2 pi m e k t by h square whole power 3 by 2 exponential e f minus e c upon k t. So, let us understand the terms. In long answer questions, we are going to see the derivation. But here you will only write the expression and explain the terms. 2, 2 pi are constants. M e here represents, M e star in fact, it represents the effective mass of electron. It is the effective mass of electron. And k here, or sometimes we may also write it as k suffix b, represents the Boltzmann constant. It is a constant given by the scientist Boltzmann. So, we call it as Boltzmann constant. T represents the temperature. H is the Planck's constant. So, this is also a constant whose value is around 6.625 into 10 to the power of minus 34 joules second. So, this is these are the terms. Here you have EF. EF represents the Fermi energy level. Fermi level. And EC represents the lowest level in the conduction band. Because when we are talking about the arrangement, we have this is the valence band and this is the conduction band. Now, if we are talking about a semiconductor, there is a small gap we have seen. So, now we will call this as EC and this is EV. So, what is EC here? The lowest level in the conduction band, we call it as EC. So, lowest level in conduction band. So, K and T we have already defined. KB is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature. So, if you know all these values, you can very easily calculate the electron concentration. Now, let us see the whole concentration in valence band. So, what is the concentration of holes in the valence band? So, this is represented by P. So, what P represents here is the whole concentration. The whole concentration is denoted by And 2 pi m h. Here m h star represents the effective mass of holes. Effective mass of holes. And the other terms remain the same. K is the Boltzmann constant. T is the temperature. H is the Planck's constant. And E v here denotes the Topmost level in the valence band. Top most level in valence band. Because we are talking about the whole concentration in valence band. So, what we have seen here, if this is the valence band, this level, the topmost level here we are calling as a, if this is the valence band, there are different levels here. So, the topmost level we are calling it as EV. So, EV represents the topmost level in the valence band. So, all the other terms remain the same. We have discussed all. So, the whole concentration, of course, the whole concentration should be equal to the electron concentration in the conduction band because whatever electrons that are moving from the valence band to the conduction band, there are holes generated in the conduction band. So, this is the expression for concentration. Now, what is intrinsic carrier concentration? So, when we are talking about intrinsic carrier concentration in semiconductor, in a semiconductor, both electrons and holes are the charge carriers. So, the conduction is due to both. So, when we talk about intrinsic carrier concentration, it is due to the electrons as well as the holes. So, the intrinsic carrier concentration is denoted by Ni. Ni denotes intrinsic carrier concentration.
and the other terms we are going to discuss here 2 2 pi constant m star here denotes the effective mass of the charge be it the electron or the hole we are considering them to be almost equal and we are putting it as m star m star al already we have discussed it is the effective mass of the charge and kb is the boltzmann constant t is the temperature h is the planck's constant and here eg denotes the energy gap So, what we try to understand here, the intrinsic carrier concentration definitely depends upon the energy gap that is between the valence band and the conduction band. Kb and T we have already discussed. So, here you will only have to explain the terms and write the expression for short answer. In long answer, we are going to derive the expression for this. Next, give the expression for Fermi level in intrinsic semiconductor. So, we want to write the expression for the Fermi level and we are also going to define Fermi energy and write the Fermi distribution function. So, all the three we are going to see at a stretch. Fermi level, Fermi energy and also Fermi distribution function. So, the first one is Fermi level. So, what is the expression for the Fermi level? EF is equal to EC plus EV by 2 plus 3 by 4 KBT ln MP by MP. So, when we are deriving the expression for the Fermi level, so that is given by EC. EC is the lowest level in the conduction band. EV is the highest level in the valence band by 2 plus 3 by 4 KB. KB is the Boltzmann constant. T is the temperature ln mp by me mp here denotes the effective mass of holes and me denotes the me star denotes the effective mass of electrons now at t is equal to 0 kelvin if this t becomes 0 at t is equal to 0 this whole term goes to 0 so we are left only with ef is equal to ec plus ev by 2 so, what does this expression denote? The Fermi level lies between EC and EV of the energy gap. So, when we are talking about uh, the energy gap, this is the valence band, this is the conduction band, this is the lowest level in the conduction band EC, this is the highest level. Now, when we are talking about EF, EF lies between EC and EV. So, this lies exactly between EC and EV. So, this is EF and it is in between the energy gap. So, we are also talking about it is lying in the energy gap exactly in the middle. Now, what is this Fermi level? The highest energy level that an electron can occupy at absolute zero temperature we call it as Fermi level. Means there are no electrons above that. This is the highest filled energy level. We are calling it as the Fermi level. And this Fermi level lies between the valence band and the conduction band at zero temperature. So if you see here, this is the Fermi level, which lies between EC and EV at absolute zero temperature. And the electrons are all in the lowest energy state. So, at absolute zero temperature, there is no excitation. So, all of them are in the lowest energy state. Now, what is Fermi energy? After Fermi level comes the Fermi energy. The value of the Fermi level at absolute zero temperature, we call it as Fermi energy. So, the value we are calling it as Fermi energy. It is also the maximum kinetic energy an electron can attain at 0 Kelvin. So, Fermi energy is a constant for each solid. If you are taking talking about different solids, for each solid the Fermi level is, the Fermi energy is constant. Now, coming to the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. Fermi and Dirac are two scientists who collaborated to explain the distribution of these charge carriers. And they have given a function how they occupy in different levels. So, that is given by Fc of E 
is equal to 1 upon 1 plus E minus EF by KBT. So, all the terms are known. F here denotes the Fermi level. Fc here is equal to 1 upon 1 plus E power exponential E minus EF by KBT. E is the energy, EF is the Fermi level, Fermi energy divided by KBT. So, when E is greater than EF and this value is more, so what we do is this value E power E minus EF by KT will be definitely much, much greater than 1. Now, write the expression for carrier concentration of electrons in n-type. So, when we have discussed n-type, we are adding a pentavalent impurity. So, it is always a donor impurity. So, it always has the excess of electrons. So, what is the concentration of electrons in n-type? So, the concentration of electrons in n-type always depends upon the donor, the concentration of the impurity we are adding. So, n extrinsic n type is given by 2 n d power half, 2 pi m b m e k b t by h square power 3 by 4 exponential minus e c minus e d by 2 k b t. So, here we can understand this is for extrinsic type we are talking about n type. So, in n type, what we have is the donor concentration. So, n d here represents the donor concentration. And all the other terms we have discussed, 2 pi constant, m e is the effective mass, k b Boltzmann constant, t temperature, h is the Planck's constant, exponential e c is the lowest level in the conduction band. And here e d is the donor level. So, when we are talking about an n type, If this is the valence band and this is the conduction band, when you are adding an impurity, so there will be a level here which we call it as the donor level. So all the electrons belonging to the donor atoms are here, so which we call it as Ed. So Ec minus Ed upon 2 kb. The same thing we are writing it in a different way. An extrinsic can also be written as uh, minus, I can uh, take out the minus so I can write it as Ed minus Ec also. Here both represent the same. Now what is the expression for the carrier concentration of holes in p type? So we have now seen the expression for carrier concentration of electrons in n type. So if it is p type, it is holes. So, what is the expression for holes? So, n extrinsic p type is given by 2 pi m p k b t by h square power 3 by 2 exponential e v minus e a. I can write it as directly. This is uh, uh, after simplifying. We will consider only this. We will consider only this expression. You need not write the derivation. You can write it as 2 n a power half 2 pi m p k b t by h square power 3 by 4 exponential minus of e a minus e v by k b t. All the other terms we have discussed, n a here represents the acceptor concentration and e a denotes the acceptor level. So, in p type, what will happen because of the impurities that we are adding, there are holes. And there is a level which we call it as acceptor level just above the valence band. In case of n type, it was just below the donor level is just below the conduction band. But in p type, you will have an acceptor level just above the valence band. So, E a here denotes the energy of this level. Now, coming to Hall effect. What is Hall effect? When a material carrying current is subjected to a magnetic field in a direction proportional to the direction of flow of current, an electric field is developed in a direction perpendicular to both the directions of magnetic field and current. So, we will try to split it and understand. So, we are taking a material, maybe a semiconducting material here. 
So this is the material. You can see the block here. There is a semiconducting material. Okay, cubical block we have shown. So this is carrying current. So we see this is the flow of current along the x-axis. We will denote it by Ix along the x-axis. This is subjected to a magnetic field. So we are applying a magnetic field. How we are applying a magnetic field? Perpendicular. Perpendicular to the direction of the flow of current. So if I is along the x-axis, B is along the z-axis. So x and z are perpendicular to each other. Then what happens? An electric field is developed. So how is the electric field developed here? Because of these two, the current and the magnetic field, there will be a force acting on the charges. So they get separated. So when they get separated, suppose in this case, all the holes are here and the electrons are on this side. So they develops a field between the two. So an electric field is developed and this is in a direction perpendicular to both along the y direction. So if I is along the x axis, B is along the z axis, the electric field that is developed is along the y axis. So these three are mutually perpendicular. So they, it is developed in a direction perpendicular to both magnetic field and current. So this phenomenon, we are calling it as Hall effect. And because of the separation of charges, this is at a higher potential, this is at a lower potential. So there exists a potential difference between the two. And the voltage can be measured with the help of a voltmeter, which we call it as the Hall voltage. Now draw diagram showing carrier concentration at T is equal to 0 Kelvin and T greater than 0 Kelvin for N-type and P-type semiconductor. So we are discussing about the charge uh, carrier excitation at different temperatures, both in N-type and P-type. We will try to understand it with the help of the diagrams. So first we'll see for N-type. So N-type is what, where we have added a pentavalent impurity. So when we are talking about a pentavalent impurity like phosphorus, there is always an extra electron, five electrons it has. All the four electrons will form bonds and there is always one free electron. So how do we represent it in the band diagram? So all the free electrons are in the donor level. So there exists a level just below the conduction band where we have the donor electrons. So the donor levels are occupied. So this is the valence band at 0 Kelvin. We are talking first about 0 Kelvin. The valence band which is completely full, the conduction band empty. But because of adding an impurity and because it's an n-type impurity, we have free electrons and all the free electrons reside in this donor level. So these donor levels are occupied. So at T is equal to 0 Kelvin, what we see here is a donor level. Now, as the temperature increases at T greater than 0 Kelvin, what happens when you increase the temperature? First, these electrons from the donor level will move into the conduction band. They start conducting. In the conduction band means they are free, so they can't. They start conducting. So the variation of the Fermi level, there is a Fermi level variation. So the Fermi level will shift upwards because of the donor level here. It will shift from donor to PC. Now let us see for P-type. So in P-type what we are doing, we are adding a trivalent impurity, say boron. It has only three electrons. So there is one deficiency of electron, which we call it as hole. So we are having an electron from a broken bond. So we have a hole. 
So all these holes, they are corresponding to acceptor impurities. So they form, uh, they reside in a level just above the valence band, which we call as the acceptor level. EA denotes the acceptor level. And these are all the holes which are there in the acceptor level at 0 Kelvin. So the valence band is full. The conduction band is empty. And these donor atoms, which we have added, all the holes due to the donor atoms, we are representing them in the level Ea. Now, as the temperature increases at T greater than 0 Kelvin, what happens now? The electrons from the valence band first fill this. Holes are nothing but deficiency of electrons. So, the valence uh, electrons from the valence band will go to the acceptor level. So, the acceptor level is filled. So, the Fermi level again shifts here. Next one is differentiate between n-type and p-type. Because we have discussed all, we are just going to summarize what is n-type and what is p-type. So, n-type is obtained by doping an intrinsic semiconductor with pentavalent impurity. This is important. How do we get n-type? Pentavalent impurity. P-type, we are going to add a trivalent impurity. And in n-type, electrons are the majority carriers. And in P-type, holes are the majority carriers. And in n-type, there is a donor energy level which is very close to the conduction band, which we have already seen in the diagram. And here the acceptor levels are very close to the valence band. Then when the temperature is increased, the semiconductors can easily donate an electron from the donor energy level to conduction band. So the electrons are now moving from the donor level to the conduction band. Here when temperature increases, what happens? The electrons are accepted by the acceptor level, which is just above the valence band. Now we come to long answer questions. So long answer questions are usually for 7 marks in the SAE paper. So I am not going to discuss uh, or explain in detail all the answers to these questions. I will just give you the brief outline. If you have any doubts regarding this, you can refer to the particular video. Suppose I am talking about a question on block theorem. You can refer to the video on block theorem and understand the whole answer. Okay. Here I will be just giving you the brief outline. So explain in detail Bloch's theorem and the motion of electron in a periodic potential. So with the help of the Bloch theorem, we are trying to understand how the motion of the electron is there in a periodic potential. So Bloch has introduced this periodicity. So first you have to explain how the periodicity is. And the periodicity is uniform. So uk of x is equal to uk of x and throughout the crystal we are distributing. Now write the function, modify the wave function with respect to this periodicity. So we have uk of x plus n a e power i k of x plus n a. You simplify the whole thing. What we get is psi k of x e power i k of n a. Now what we are going to do is we have to multiply it with the complex conjugate because we know psi is not a, it is a complex quantity. So in order to make it real what we do is we multiply it with its complex conjugate. Psi k star of x plus n a. So, write first the complex conjugate and take the product. So, when you multiply, what you are left with is only psi k of x into psi k star of x. So, what this represents is whatever the probability of finding the electron at x is the same as x plus n a. So, the probability of finding the electron is the same in the whole lattice. This is the main essence of this block. Theorem. So, you will have to derive this expression and explain. Now, the next one is show the energy spectrum of an electron that contains a number of allowed bands separated by forbidden bands using the 
chronic penny model. So, how did chronic and penny explain their model to understand the energy spectrum? So, let us see the chronic penny model. So, this Schrodinger wave equations we have, uh, we are going to write them for two different regions, one and two. So, this is the square well potential. So, there is, this is the region one, where when the electron is inside this, the potential is zero. That is between zero to A. The limits are between zero to A. And when it is between zero to minus B, we call it as region two, where the potential is maximum. So, in these two regions, how the wave equations are going to modify, first we have to write. So, we will first take our main Schrodinger wave equation, dou square psi by dou x square plus 2m into e minus v by h cross square psi. But we are putting v is equal to 0 in the region 1. So, we are not writing v. This is in the region 1, that is for x lying between 0 and a. And then for the second region, that is, for x lying between minus b and 0, we are modifying the equation as 2m into e minus v naught by h square. So, here it is 0, so we are eliminating v. Here it is v naught, so we are writing v naught. And then by solving, what we are getting is this expression. Cos k is equal to p sin alpha a by alpha a plus cos alpha a. And if we have to represent it graphically, if you are plotting a graph for alpha a versus p sin alpha a by alpha a plus cos alpha a. So, what is there on the right hand side? So, we are getting a graph something like this. So, there are very important conclusions that are drawn by Kronig and Penny, which helps us to understand the allowed bands and the forbidden bands. Because of this cos k a, there is a limit to the values it can have. Cost can have values only between plus 1 and minus 1. So, in this graph, only these regions between plus 1 and minus 1 are allowed. So, these bands are, these are allowed bands. Only these energies are allowed. And if you talk about these things, the gaps in between, they are forbidden. So, that is how Kronig and Penny explained with their model that there will be allowed bands separated by forbidden bands. Next, explain the origin of uh, energy band formation in solids. So, in energy band, uh, how we are discussing about is, if we are talking about uh, the equilibrium spacing of different elements and versus energy. So, how are the energies in different types of materials? So, when we talk about metals here, there is an overlap between the two, the valence band and the conduction band. There is an overlap. In case of semiconductor, there will be a small gap and in insulators, the gap is big. So, this is the forbidden energy gap. So, that is how we explain the classification based on the energy gap. Next, compare intrinsic and extrinsic. You will have to only list down. Intrinsic is pure. This is impure. Here, holes and electrons are equal. But here, depending upon the type, if it is a p-type, holes are more. If it is n-type, electrons are more. And in intrinsic semiconductor, Fermi level lies between valence band and conduction band. It lies exactly in between. But if you see in an extrinsic semiconductor, Fermi level lies near the valence band in p-type and near the conduction band in n-type. We have already discussed. And the ratio of majority and minority carriers is unity. Here, if you see in intrinsic semiconductor, there is nothing like minority and majority. The number of electrons is always equal to the number of holes. So, therefore, the ratio is unity. But in case, the ratio is not unity. Now, the majority... We have seen in uh, p-type, the holes are the majority carriers and n-type, the electrons are the major. So, it is not unity. Now, obtain an expression for the carrier concentration in n-type. So, as I told you, I am not going to do the entire derivation. I am just going you to tell you the 
outline of how to derive the expression. So, first to derive the electron concentration in conduction band. So, what you have to understand is these electrons are in different states. So, you should know first the density of energy states which is given by Zc of E d. And then you should know the Fermi Dirac distribution which tells how these electrons are arranged in these states. So, once you know about the density of states and the Fermi Dirac, so, you can calculate the concentration by using this expression. Zc of E d e will be multiplied by Fc of E. So, this is the density of states and this is the Fermi Dirac. Now, we are going to write the expression first for Zc and Fc and then take the product. So, what is the expression for Fc? We are getting E power E f minus E by kbt after simplifying. So, this gives the Fermi Dirac. Then we are going to talk about the density of states. We don't derive it, we take it as it is. Pi by 2, 8 me by h square power 3 by 2, e power half. So, now we are going to substitute these two in n. Zc of e multiplied by f of e. And then go keep on simplifying. So, the steps are, first you have to write the expression for Zc of e. Then you should also know how they are distributed. Then we have to take the product and also we are taking the integral because throughout the entire region we have to take from EC to infinity. That is why we are integrated. So simplify what you get here is this is all the derivation. Once you substitute for n the final expression what you will get is n is equal to 2 into 2 pi 8 pi me kbt by h square e power e f minus e b by kbt that we have already seen. Now coming to the whole concentration. So because we are talking in a uh, pure semiconductor that is intrinsic semiconductor definitely the number of holes is equal to the number of electrons and here we are denoting it by so, again here also first thing we need to know is the density of states in the valence band. Zb here denotes the density of states in the valence band. And the Fermi Dirac distribution for the holes, distribution of holes in this levels. And P will be the product of these two, Zb of E and Fh of E. So, separately write the expressions for Fh. Fermi Dirac distribution and then the density of states Zb. Now you are going to multiply the two and then integrate. So when we multiply and integrate, what we are going to get here is P. P is equal to 8 by 4 to pi A mp kbt by h square power 3 by 2 e power ev minus e by kbt. Here we have also simplified this and written 2 into 2 pi mp kbt by h square power 3 by 2. Now find the mathematical expression for intrinsic carrier concentration. So why we are talking about intrinsic carrier concentration here is we have both holes and electrons. So due to both how we are going to get the intrinsic carrier concentration and then we are also going to get the expression for Fermi level. So the ratio of uh, free electrons and holes per unit volume, we are calling it as intrinsic carrier concentration. And as I told you, n is equal to p is equal to nr. So the number of electrons is always equal to the number of holes. So n into p, here we will write it as ni into ni. And if we want ni, it will be np power half. So we have separately derived expression for n which is denoted by this. We have derived the expression for P, which is denoted by this. Now we are going to take the product and then take the square. So when you take the product and take the square root, what is the expression we are getting here is 2 into 2 pi kbt by h square power 3 by 2 me mp power 3 by 4 e power minus eg by 2 kbt. 
So this is the final expression we are talking about. And of course, of all the constants, whatever is constant, we also can put it as a constant. So C T power 3 by 2 E power minus E G by 2 K B T. Now coming to the Fermi level. So how are we going to get the expression for Fermi level? So N is equal to P. We'll start here. The concentration of electrons in the conduction band is always equal to the concentration of holes in the valence band. So we have expressions for N as well as P. So this is the expression for N and this is the expression for P. So equate these two and cancel whatever terms are getting cancelled. And we will try to just rearrange the terms and get EF. So how do we get EF here? EF is equal to EC plus EV by 2 plus 3 by 4 kVT ln MP by ME. This is a general expression at any temperature. At any temperature T greater than 0 Kelvin. But when the temperature T is equal to 0 means at absolute temperature, what is happening? This term goes to 0 and we are left only with this term EC plus EV by 2. So EF is equal to EC plus EV by 2. So what does this mean? This means that EF lies between EC and EV. So this is the conclusion regarding the Fermi level. The Fermi level always lies between EC and EV in an intrinsic semiconductor. So let us stop here and we will continue our discussion in the next class. Thank you and see you again in the next lecture. Like, share and subscribe. Hit the bell icon for more updates.